we could be anywhere. Thank you very much, Loic. I think that was the perfect uh, background for the next panel. Uh, I'm very delighted to invite the next panel to join us on stage. After this comprehensive overview at global level, we are delighted to invite major jurisdiction to join the panel. We ask a representative of Singapore, of course, we have seen the first issuance of cover bonds in Singapore, from South Korea, from Brazil, from Poland, and from, uh, uh, from Turkey to come on stage to share with us their experience and um, this will, should give us a good overview of the, develop, the, the development of, of carbon bonds at, 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 at international level. Thank you very much. Well then, uh, good afternoon everybody uh, for what I would call the full house of today's panels. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for making it in time from so far away. Um, I think we've uh, heard a lot of topics that were discussed today, changes in the carbon bond world, uh, pretty much a urgent and pressing topic, whether this is uh, LCR implications, whether this is green bonds, whether this is conditional pass-through, or whether this is uh, covered bond purchasing program three. Something that we might sometimes forget uh, is how the landscape uh, in general changes, and I think uh, Loic has uh, been doing a great job by outlawing uh, that covered bond uh, uh, world is expanding rapidly, but sometimes we don't see it because it happens under the surface. So from this point of view, uh, I think uh, that there's been uh, comments already about uh, how many new issuers have found their way into the covered bond market by already issuing, uh, and there is more preparing, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, on board issuers uh, who both have already issued and are just about to prepare their entry to the market. Uh, so from this point of view, very happy to introduce you to my fellow panelists. Uh, from uh, your uh, left to uh, right, um, starting with uh, Colin Chen, who's a managing, di managing director and head uh, structured debt solutions, treasury and markets at DBS Bank. And uh, in addition, uh, Colin also is the inaugural chairman of the Association of Banks in Singapore Standing Committee of Covered Bonds. Next in line is uh, DG Kim. He's a team head of the Securitization Department at the Korea Housing Finance Corporation. Then we have uh, Romulo de Man Magalies, Deputy Advisor, Financial System Regulation Department at Banco Central do Brasil. Jakub Nisluchowski, Vice President of the Managing Board and responsible for Treasury at PKO Bank Hypotechnia. Um, then we have Philippe Pontual from Brazil as well, Managing Director of ABCIP, which is the Brazilian Mortgage Banks Association. David Power, Vice President in charge of funding at the Royal Bank of Canada. And last but not least, our friend Batuhan Tufan, Senior Vice President and Head of Financial Institutions at Garanti Bank. To make me summarize very quickly, I think the topic of new jurisdictions probably is not a new one, but it's, it's getting an increasingly hot topic, I would say. Uh, and again, um, as we have uh, already explained, some issuers have found their way into the market and many are still working very hard. Uh, and I think uh, it would be no surprise to see some of the names uh, in the panel, or at least from the countries present uh, in the panel, uh, finding their way to the market uh, anytime uh, this year. Um, I think for an audience uh, who uh, also includes uh, market participants and uh, investors likewise, it is very interesting to find out where you stand and in particular the opportunities this brings for them in a, a market that is, I think is highly distorted. I will not repeat all of the arguments we have exchanged today, uh, but it's probably uh, fair to say that uh, the markets we're talking about today uh, on this panel here uh, offer value for money, at least potentially, because uh, they are not subject uh, to the ECB's uh, strong uh, impact, um, at least not direct impact. Um, from this uh, being said, uh, I will make sure that we stay as pragmatic as possible by, with your kind permission, David, referring to your real life experience as the Royal Bank of Canada is obviously the most uh, experienced uh, uh, issuer here on this panel, so I'm happy uh, if you could share some of your insights. Um, thank you, yes. Yeah. So Royal Bank of Canada, we launched our um, covered bond program, as many of you 
Uh, no, I think I came to the Berlin conference in um, 2007, and that was the uh, we launched one month after that. Um, since that time, we've issued in um, six different uh, currencies, uh, all benchmark bonds um, in in all of those currencies. Um, we've got about 30% of our outstandings is in euros, so euros is not the majority of our covered bond program. Um, we actually have uh, slightly more outstanding in dollars, I believe, than euros, um, but we're also in Canadian dollars, Swiss francs, um, sterling, and Australian dollars. Um, our program's over 30 billion Canadian in outstandings. Um, the original program we launched in 2007 was a uh, structured program. Uh, since that time, the government was uh, kind enough to pass uh, some legislation and appoint an administrator for the program and set some uh, um, uh, harmonized standards for the structure um, and also the reporting, which were already fairly well aligned in the first place, but um, sort of fine-tune that a little bit further. Um, so that's sort of a brief, a brief overview. I don't know if you have a specific question or... I think we, we might uh, refer to you several times during, <laughs> during the discussion. Maybe to start with, with Colin, then next uh, in line, you have just done your uh, debut transaction successfully entering the market with a, a US dollar transaction. Could you share with us maybe in two, three uh, minutes, let's say, what was the background? Uh, and in particular, why did it happen now? I think that was one of the questions that came up. Is there a, is there a chicken or egg situation? Uh, what did finally trigger a DBS a successful market entry this year? Thank you, Patrick. Um, I think um, you might have heard and seen me for the last two conferences talking about Singapore. It's finally happened. Um, after three and a half long years of uh, <clears throat> regulatory engagement um, <clears throat> um, from a Singapore perspective, uh, why DBS chooses a time where there was volatility in the market? I think DBS has always said that uh, it, the covered bond um, market avails a strategic opportunity in terms of complementing its funding requirements. Uh, it's not something that it's a primary source of funding. It is something that is, uh, will complement and supplement DBS's ability to tap incremental funding. Um, so uh, as to when, how, I think we have said that we have always wanted to come to market. Um, we have been working on it for three and a half years. Um, and perhaps if I can take the time to share why did it take three and a half years. Uh, I, you, you may have seen and heard and, you know, the financial press talking about the difficulties of... Um, aligning the various parties, uh, the regulator, the internal stakeholders, but as a AAA jurisdiction, uh, with the banks in Singapore being AA, there was no reason other than to make and, and to ensure that the product would be a AAA product. Right? So that, that's why it accounted for the three and a half years of uh, work time it took to get the, the product to market. If you could do it again, would you do it the same way or would you change anything? I can't quite leave the country. Um, but <laughs> you don't have to, it's triple A. <laughs> uh, but I think we would have done it pretty much uh, the same way. I think we, we took our lessons from uh, uh, how other common law jurisdictions um, uh, implemented their programs. Um, let's put it this way, we, we learned from um, the successes of uh, our predecessors. Um, but more importantly, we had to be relevant uh, to the Singapore market. And then subsequently, how do we ensure that we are then uh, benchmarked against with what we, I call the core cover bond uh, issuers in terms of um, um, the structure and perhaps um, how the reporting transparency templates all dovetail. I think we wanted to ensure that the product is not uh, an outlier but more uh, mainstream compared to the European cover bond product. I like the word mainstream. Maybe I can refer again to, to David. You've been selling a couple of your covered bonds by now. How easy of a sell has it actually been to get across a, a relatively straightforward product? Yeah, I think, um, I think being uh, as mainstream, I, I mean, I think it's obviously it's, it's fine to have uh, differences between countries. Um, and I think a lot of panelists throughout and, and other commentators throughout the day have, have, have said we're not all going to have the same mortgage market or the same capital markets, um, you know, across the world. And, and, and as Luca said, it's to explain the differences, not, not to necessarily get rid of them. Um, but I think when you have a choice between, um, 
you know, doing something unique and sort of staying mainstream and following and respecting the, the European uh, traditions, and I, I think you're, you're generally better served by staying in that mainstream uh, area. I mean, I, we, um, we basically um, adopted, uh, when our original program was uh, modeled largely off of some of the UK um, structured programs back in 2007, um, we did modify it and uh, um, put the demand loan feature in, which has since been copied by um, some of the other jurisdictions as well, um, and, and has become the standard in Canada. But by and large, we stayed uh, stayed true to the European model, and that's one of the reasons why we we did want to seek the legislation um, as well, because that was the you know the expectation in Europe was to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Um, Maybe, uh, Jakub, uh, in, in a nutshell, how far away is Poland from actually entering the market uh, with all these changes in legislation we've just heard about before? Are you any, uh, anywhere nearby uh, following the path of uh, what we've just heard from uh, DBS and Royal Bank of Canada? Uh, actually, from my perspective, we as a mortgage bank, PKO Mortgage Bank, we are operating starting 1st April this year. So we, we as a bank are at the beginning of the work, uh, of our work, uh, actually, with uh, gathering cover pool with uh, rating agencies. However, here we have uh, at least one one stage finished, and uh, now we are also working on the program. Uh, in terms of our uh, actually ambitions, uh, we uh, would like to have first domestic issuance uh, first quarter next year, uh, and then uh, have foreign uh, issuance uh, second, third quarter, next, next, also next year. Uh, so from this point, this point of view, actually, uh, we have, I, I would say, half a year, one, one, one year perspective. Uh, and what, what is actually is uh, crucial here, uh, from my point of view, is uh, deep law amendments, which we actually discussed. And uh, referring to the discussions, it was actually joint cooperation between regulation, our mortgage foundation, and banks, uh, which give us uh, and should boost the coverage, uh, covered bond markets. I was just about to ask you, what is the limiting factor then? Is uh, collateral potentially and still and some amendments? Ca uh, currently, for, for, for us, yeah. uh, it's just to uh, gather adequate cover pool, which okay. will, in our case, based solely on the residential mortgages denominated in Polish lotus. I think that's a program, uh, Batuhan, you don't, you don't have, uh, I think you have plenty of uh, collateral on your balance sheet. Uh, so let's say, how, how far are you from crossing the finishing line uh, into the covered bond market? Um, well, Patrick, this is the, uh, the third covered bond congress uh, that I'm attending. Uh, and it was hot in Vienna already last year, as far as I can exactly. remember. <laughs> it, was, it was quite advanced at that time as well, but uh, I have to say that we had to put around two and a half years of work into establishing the program. Uh, this not only included, of course, internal arrangements, uh, data gathering, etc., etc., but uh, once we became more familiar with the product and other, other jurisdictions, uh, in fact, we, we uh, realized that there were cer certain amendments or alignments that were needed uh, for, the, uh, for a covered bond law to be prepared, which is now in place. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, uh, almost ready. We have established our program. The only missing part, and that's almost coming through, and I think that was also touched upon in the previous panel, is that um, in Turkey, unfortunately, we do not have the institutional investor capacity, so we will probably not be able to issue in Turkish liras or in other currencies domestically. So we have to do the investor work uh, internationally, and we will need to target the European investors, uh, and that will require us to have uh, a swap arrangement in place, so using Turkish lira denominated assets and issuing into, into the European capital markets in euro denomination. Okay, but I think the, the key word was in place, right? It's in place uh, now. So yes. in terms now, of now we're uh, looking, looking expectation at, management at and time management. Uh, to maybe uh, get back uh, from two what I would consider market leaders in their respective countries, PKO Bank and, and Garanti Bank, uh, maybe a word on Korea Housing Finance Corporation. DG, could you, for 
all of those, including myself, who don't know the Korean market very well, in a nutshell, uh, share with us uh, your view on the Korean uh, mortgage market and, and also the role of your good institution. Okay, thank you. Uh, KHFC is 100% owned by Korean government, so it is a quasi government entity. So our main business is to buy uh, fixed rate mortgage loans from the financial institutions such as commercial banks and securitize those assets through the MBS, US, uh, American style MBS and covered bond to the capital market investors. So uh, mortgage securitization is our main business. However, up until uh, 2008 global financial crisis, KHFC only issued US style MBS to domestic investors. However, uh, during 2008 global financial crisis, we faced difficulties, uh, difficulties to issue MBS, even in domestic market. That's why we have decided to uh, diversify our funding sources, not only funding sources into covered bond, but also investor base internationally. Uh, after dedication of time and effort, KHFC successfully issued first global covered bond in 2010. So now we do have a two funding platform, uh, so which means more stable uh, funding structure, we believe. Are there any particularities about the Korean mortgage market that we need to know? How big is the housing market? How strong has it grown over, over time? How essential is it for, for Korean banks in terms of business model? Uh, right now, the interest environment is very uh, favorable for the mortgage industry. As you may know, that the uh, interest rate is very low, dramatically. So the housing loan is growing, in, growing constantly, and then the house price is uh, increasing constantly as well. So the, uh, right now, the banks, the commercial banks, they, uh, they have to uh, securitize those assets. But one more thing I want to mention about Korean uh, housing loans uh, is credit quality is very good. The one month's over delinquency rate ratio is like less than 1%, maybe 0.5% uh, around. So the quality is very good. Keyword, very good, I think. Let's go to Brazil uh, from one end of the world to the other. Maybe, Philip, uh, to, to start uh, with you as a, as a representative of the mortgage banks. Where do, where do we stand in, in a nutshell uh, on, on Brazil? I remember you did a presentation last year as well, so it seems you have to come back a couple of times before things get really hot, but uh, how hot is it on Brazil? Okay, um, well, our market is, our mortgage market is, some, is around $50 billion a year. It grew very fast since 2007. Uh, so we went some, from something like 1.92% of GDP to almost 10% of GDP last year. And because of that growth, we were foreseeing that eventually we would run out of the regular source of funding. So we've been working, uh, uh, advocating the, uh, an, for an instrument such as the cover bonds since 2010. And in just January, uh, a law was enacted uh, uh, regulating or establishing uh, the uh, cover bond in Brazil, which is called LIG. Um, so so uh, all this was done also with a good work from the, point of, from the, from, from the central bank side and, the, uh, and the, um, uh, also the Minister of Finance that actually invited a, a mission from um, uh, World Bank, where Budwing and Luca was, were part of, uh, to help them uh, structure a, uh, say, I would say a modern cover bond uh, structure. Uh, the central bank had studied this a lot, so they, I think they helped a lot, the, the Minister of Finance, so they came, they, they came up with this law that actually very wisely uh, passed on to the regulator or to the National Monetary Council a lot of the uh, fine tuning of the regulation so that you can cope with market de de developments. Now, from in talking just a little bit more about our market, it is, uh, the credit quality is pretty good. It is uh, uh, the uh, LTV is around 65%. So there's a lot of room for, for uh, if, if, if somebody doesn't pay, but even, but even that makes uh, the, the, the debtor 
very keen and keeping keeping current with its with uh, their debt. So our loss is uh, below one percent uh, after recovery, and uh, 90 day past due is just 1.4 percent. Mm -hmm. Even now, when we have a, a kind of a economic uh, downturn. Omulu from uh, Banco Central do Brasil. Is there anything you you'd, you'd like to add on the importance of? Uh, covered bonds for Brazilian banks looking forward? Yeah, as uh, Felipe mentioned, uh, this, this year in January, uh, we just passed the law uh, establishing the, the, the legal framework for covered bonds, and most of the, the covered uh, bond uh, features were delegated to, to, to be established by the, the uh, Monetary National Council. So the, the central bank is part of that, that council, and we are uh, right now uh, working hard on that developing those regulations and trying to to follow the best practices uh, uh, in in major markets uh, such as uh, Europe and, and other markets so we, we are uh, collecting and, and reading a, a lot of uh, uh, regulations from different uh, jurisdictions and and trying to keep what is the, the most appropriate for for Brazil well uh, quote you on the best practice later on in the discussion. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the, the key legal features that, that were established by the, by the, the legal framework, uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile to mention here, like the 5% the, the minimum uh, OC, uh, OC, well, the, the solution to, to implement the segregation of, of assets of the cover pool and the ring fencing uh, of those cover assets was the this, uh, establishment of, of a fiduciary uh, regime. So that that, that is the, the, the legal uh, solution that was adopted. We, uh, it seems that the, the market uh, is uh, uh, very satisfied with, with that solution because we, we, we had some positive feedback from, from the, the, okay. the legal framework. Well, uh, there are some uh, uh, interest things uh, and, and difficult, complex things to, to regulate, uh, such as uh, uh, within this, this fiduciary regime, uh, the role of the uh, fiduciary agent, which is uh, uh, the agent that is indicated by the, uh, uh, the start in the issuance of, of the cover bond, and uh, it, is, it has uh, two roles. Uh, first, as the monitor of the cover assets in, in the during the ongoing uh, functioning of the institution, and, and also it is uh, in charge of the administration of the, the, the cover pool in case of, of bank uh, insolvency. Okay. So we have to, to now establish uh, uh, what are the, the, the responsibilities and the, the exact uh, role that this fiduciary agent has, uh, has to play during the... Okay. There obviously become pretty pretty deep into the, the topic of, of regulation. I remember what David said, uh, keep it straightforward, keep it uh, mainstream in, in, in some way, uh, given the fact uh, how long it took to okay. explain. Uh, maybe there, there's a bit more work that, that needs to be done. But, but let's, let's, uh, let's start with David. If you just look back to where you came from in the structured world, to the legal covered bond, um, what were the essential changes in your opinion, or how much easier did it make you, the job for you as Royal Bank of Canada to issue covered bonds? Well, um, I think that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, we felt it was a natural evolution of the product. Um, again, it, it was uh, seemingly quite important to a lot of investors. Um, and, and in doing that, it, it brought a lot of structural enhancements. It brought indexing into um, our programs, mandatory indexing as well uh, into the programs. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, I have to admit, though, it, it, the, the advantages we gained were perhaps not as tangible as you might imagine, and, and part of that might just be that um, we had a very receptive um, investor base um, in Europe and elsewhere to the, to the Canadian, to the country, to, to the Canadian banking system, um, to our, our mortgage market. There, there, there was sort of a um, thankfully for us, an underlying um, um, interest in investing. Um, 
you know, and, and so, it, it, you know, it is important to talk to investors. Um, and like I said, uh, at the margin, you, you want to go with what, uh, what's mainstream. And so, but I, I, can't, I can't actually say that when we introduce indexing, our bond spreads seem to change or legislation may have had a little bit of an advantage, but it, it, again, we were starting from a pretty tight spread in the first place. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, w even, even within the Canadian names, hard versus soft bullet, you'd have to really uh, squint to see if there's any difference at all between those. So, um, you know, I think these things are, are important. You want to know where investors are at. Um, every one of these topics is important to somebody, but um, a little bit, li when, it, when, when the rubber hits the road, a little bit less, less than you might imagine, but that might be because we just, we're fortunate enough to have, uh, uh, you know, pretty decent access in the first place. When we brought the first structured program in October of 08, I mean, the order book was um, the order book was three and a half billion euros, and we printed that at uh, five year mid swaps plus uh, ten, I believe. So, I mean, you know, we had we had a pretty strong strong access in the first place. Okay. Well, whereas that, that was obviously the, uh, the, the, the pre-Lehman times and things, things have changed a lot. I would always look at it from a very pragmatic point of view. If, uh, uh, I think Batuhan referred to the fact you need to do investor work. If you have an hour to speak to an investor and you spend 40 minutes to s explain the legislation, probably uh, you are running a bit out of time to discuss the real essential topics of what potential demand can you expect, what is the right pricing for an issue. Uh, let's maybe... Uh, involve uh, Colin once more. Um, how helpful from your point of view was that legislation that you put so much work into and let's say um, is there anything you can share on the role of the ECBC for example in this respect? Well I think um, well first and foremost we had the benefit of time. Uh, we had three and a half years. So we were quite deliberate working together with um, um, ECBC who helped us provide a platform to articulate um, the legislation per se in Singapore. Uh, and as with all new markets, I think it was important for us to be able to articulate um, how the Singapore legislation either differed or was common to what was accepted as European uh, legislation in terms of the covered bond market. Um, so the reach out was quite structured and deliberate. We talked about the, uh, the legislation in Singapore, the framework, and the mortgage market. And I think with time, uh, we managed to get a certain comfort from investors in terms of familiarity uh, and benchmarking capability. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jakob, can you share with us maybe I think the, the quote from early on, Poland, uh, state of the art uh, legislation. Do you feel so privileged with, with the legislation you got? And uh, uh, if, if you have a second to spend on the, on the conditional pass-through features specifically, which I think is a relatively new one to the market anyway, um, and including this obviously shows uh, that, that Poland has been very receptive in adopting relatively new uh, techniques to the covered bond world. Uh, on the one hand, yes, we, we feel privileged. Of course, we'll check in, in how, how it will work in reality. However, uh, I would say we as a market are very optimistic. It will, on, on the one hand, we create and set up Figaro Mortgage Bank other hand, uh, two other banking groups already issued motion to regulator to uh, set up mortgage banks, and another t two uh, are thinking about it. Uh, so I hope in uh, next two three years we'll have six seven mortgage banks. It's a one sign I would say of the change of law for, for for us. So from the, this point of view, we see that the. Uh, I would say the mood on the market is positive. Uh, so, and looking on also on the changes which were mentioned today, uh, I can mention also by you conditional pass through. Uh, so it's a one feature which we have discussed also also with rating agencies because uh, creating the amendments to the new, new law, we looked on first on the safety of the cover bonds, and on the second to extend investor base. So. Our actually conditional pass-through structure, uh, in, uh, discussing it, it short, assumes that after bankruptcy of the uh, mortgage bank, uh, the maturity of her bonds is extended by 12 months. Uh, during these 12 months, we 
uh, actually there are two tests carried on, coverage tests, looking if there's enough coverage of uh, receivables or cobble pool to, to cover actually co uh, more covered bonds. And on the other hand, there are also uh, carried out liquidity tests. And uh, in case they are passed or, or they're failed actually, after that, it's switched to pass-through structure. Uh, with the maturity equals to maturity of the longest maturity of the asset in the cover pool for last three years. So this how our conditional pass-through structure works. Well, what is the idea behind to give as much time as necessary for I, actually, recovering value in the cover pool, obviously? Uh, uh, actually, looking from the hard bullet and conditional pass-through perspective, so in the hard bullet structure, we have the advantage of time, meaning that investor will receive money but uh, in short period of time, but it will be less than the in the condition pass through where we can wait and actually have the recovery rate on the higher level. Okay. So this actually idea behind also should have impact on the, on the rating where in such structure uh, it's clearly stated that, that the risk of Mortgage bank is really the link with the risk of the pool. Um, go back uh, and, and having a quick uh, look to, to Turkey, but one, I think it's fair to say mortgage uh, finance is, is, a, is a strategic part of your business model. Um, you are the market leader in this field. With the legislation you have, do you feel happy and, and in a situation to, to fund, uh, uh, let's say, this activity in the future as well? Certainly, I mean, uh, uh, the strategic importance of mortgages uh, for Turkey actually is a little, uh, well, funding the mortgages is obviously it's very strategic for anyone, I think, the, having the capacity to access the market and to have uh, secondary market financing of the mortgage loans, etc. Obviously, ha having the strong collateral on the back um, o should offer you some uh, decent levels to access the market, but in the case of Turkey, obviously being an emerging market country with very young demographics, um, Turkey is obviously criticized with one of uh, being one of a one of a country with low savings ratio. Um, as of today, the savings ratio is around 12 percent, but it's not that people don't save; uh, it's just that people actually save in different formats. Um, in Turkey, being uh, a country that's also close to the Orient, obviously people like to save uh, in the form of gold. That's one, one way. And the other one is, of course, investments into real estate. Um, and in fact, we as banks overall see uh, lending into mortgages, uh, growing in mortgage business as a way to increase our penetration to the savings of the country. Uh, so having so growing in, in the mortgage business, having access to mortgage financing through mortgage covered bonds, having a world class basically uh, a very similar uh, legislation to the fund prefect is probably our top strategic priority at the moment, and we think we have it at the moment so, so we, we go clearly beyond funding only, but in fact, there is a strategic dimension to it for both your good bank and, and also the country in a way. Certainly, certainly. That's the viewpoint. It's not only funding for us or having just another product to complete the uh, products that we're able to offer to the investors, but it's, uh, it's, it, it also has a, a more valuable strategic importance to, for us. Uh, Philippe, uh, on Brazil, is this... Uh, uh, well, maybe that's some, someone who wants to answer the question, huh? <laughs> Uh, on, on Brazil, uh, do you have similar observations on the role of housing to constitute funding, build funding uh, for, for uh, larger parts of the population and predominantly the, the middle class, I would expect? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, the, the point about the importance of housing to build saving, i.e. people putting money in their housing rather than a conventional savings rate, is this an observation that you have for Brazil as well? 
well, maybe not as much as in, uh, partly I understood from, from what uh, uh, is the case in Turkey. Uh, people tend to save, especially in the so-called uh, uh, savings accounts that are actually a good pool, the, the most important pool of funding for the uh, mortgage financing. Um, so, but eventually people would get into buying a home before it is ready, when it's starting the, uh, the construction, as a way of forcing themselves to, to save. But generally people save first so that they can actually, actually come up with something like 35% uh, of the value of the home before is, the, the actual... Is mortgage. this maybe an explanation why your covered bond law took a little longer to be, let's say, fully operative? To some uh, extent, I mean, the availability of suitable alternatives? Yes. Uh, because, because of the savings accounts and the um, uh, workers' uh, uh, forced saving through tech, uh, uh, payroll, there is there's a, a nice pool of, uh, of money there. Also, because for many years, the um, uh, mortgage business was a bad business, especially during the high inflation period. So starting 2006, things started to pick up very fast. And that's why we, have, we had such a explosive growth in mortgage financing since 2006. From uh, the central bank's point of view, uh, is there anything you'd like to add to this about alternative funding sources? I think uh, Philippe mentioned earlier on running out of funding sources slowly, I understand, because it's not that present. But let's say from a, from a regulatory point of view, a supervisory point of view, um, what's, what's your point on that? Yeah, for, for the central bank, it, uh, it's also a desire to have a diversification of, of uh, sources of funding for housing finance, especially after uh, 2005, when the, the, the rate of growth was uh, uh, really, really high. So uh, the cover bond, uh, as well as other uh, alternatives of, of funding were in, in our uh, studies, and uh, we since uh, 2010 or less, are studying hard on, on trying to, to introduce this. If for us, it is very important to have alternative sources of funding because uh, the, the, the high reliance that we have uh, up to now on and saving, saving uh, accounts for financing uh, housing, it, it is uh, in fact a, a past uh, solution that they, they, they had for the, the high inflation period. Okay. So uh, as uh, market conditions are not favoring saving accounts, we, we now uh, uh, have this, this, this problem of, 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 uh, of funding that we have predicted some, some years ago, and uh, it, it is really very important to have this. Okay. So in other words, let's say looking forward uh, and building the, the necessary framework for the future, uh, this is something you would give priority to the way I understand it. You give priority to cover bond uh, legislation and trying to develop it. Yes, and, uh, it is, yes. Not only see it con desirable, but hopefully push it. Push for it. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, Central Bank, uh, well, had a, a leading role in this, in this process. So uh, we have a, a participation in the, in the writing of, of the okay. law. So uh, it is very important for us, and it, and it is in the in the uh, priorities of the, mm. the, the president of the central bank to governor of the central bank to have this this uh, regulation framework approved in, in in the near future. I think uh, obviously with everyone uh, running a little late today in terms of panels, uh, we will slowly need to come to an end. But I think uh, uh, having a outlook to the future is probably not a bad idea because we promised uh, to give a bit of food of thought for, for investors and market participants on what they can expect. Uh, so from this point of view, if I may ask uh, Colin, uh, you've done your successful debut, you liked it, uh, the market liked it, so what else can we expect from you in the next, um, let's say, 12 to 18 months? Uh, perhaps I'll comment not only from DBS standpoint, but uh, from a Singapore standpoint, um, I think you would we would like to say that we would expect a couple of new issuers that will come to market within the next 12 months. Um, <clears throat> having tapped the market, I think all of the issuers will not only tap it on a singular basis, but we will want to be seen to be regular issuers as well. So um, 
I'd like to say that we'll probably see another two or three issuances come up from Singapore. Not necessarily DBS, but certainly from Singapore. Um, DG, um, a quick comment on Korea housing. I think uh, those who follow the market very closely have seen Cookmin announcing a trade that was so far not yet executed. What's your viewpoint on individual Korean banks working on their, uh, let's say, uh, covered bond programs and, and what is the implication for Korea housing finance? Uh, last year, uh, in Korea, uh, Covered Bond Act was enacted, so the commercial banks they can issue the you know, statutory covered bond uh, based on the new uh, covered bond act. So the Kumin Bank is now utilizing that new covered bond act, and then uh, they now they have an option. They can sell the mortgage loans to the KHFC, or they can issue the covered bond. So I mean, you know, we are happy. If they succeed, uh, they own the covered bond, you know, foundation. Yeah. Pretty much same picture like for Singapore. The more, the better. But that's yeah. what I'm saying. Okay. I think uh, Jakob, you said uh, we can expect you, let's say, within the next six to nine months. Um, anything else to add in this respect, or is well, this your standing statement? It's very difficult to 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 give a, a precise. Oh, sorry, it was, it was the question was to Jakob for Poland. Sorry. Sorry. If you know anything on Poland, uh, I, I will be happy to include you afterwards. Uh, actually, yes. So, so on the one hand, I would say that our, our ambition, but I think also ambitions of the, uh, my colleagues from other banks, is to be a regular issuer, and, and also on domestic and also foreign markets. So we'll knock your doors and uh, soon, just just to just to issue, and uh, I think our covered bonds will be. Uh, Good quality. I just was an uh, indication. I can say that yesterday was published a uh, provisional rating for covered bonds of Kyobank Hypoteczny, which was based on the assumption that we will have only residential mortgage in Polish lot if covered full. Uh, it was published by Moody's, what was a AA3, a limited by country ceiling. And uh, it's worth to mention that it, was, it is on the uh, current legal framework. So. We can expect more if something will happen in the country ceiling after a new law will be in place starting from 1st January 2016. So uh, just just give you an indication what we can expect after also new law will come into force and also taking into account what we will have in the COVID book. Okay. Then maybe to switch to, to Batuhan very quickly. Um, ready to go is kind of... Uh, let's say the, the, the headline uh, that, that we keep in mind for, for guarantee. Um. Um, yes, as, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, I mean, uh, we have established our program. Uh, we also have our uh, provisional uh, rating assigned uh, A3 by Moody's. Um, I think at the moment it's all a matter of uh, having uh, favorable market opportunities. So not only knocking at the door, but the door might basically be almost open uh, in this respect, subject to a bit of fine-tuning. Exactly. Hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe to uh, once again conclude then with, with, with David. Uh, David, you've, you've used uh, that uh, covered bond uh, program very extensively. I think you've expanded it into, into various currency. If you could just in a, in a nutshell describe what, what is the current importance uh, in terms of funding uh, and, and across currencies, uh, just a few uh, highlights maybe you'd like to share with us uh, to conclude. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, we've, uh, we've obviously been using our, our covered bond program extensively. Um, in the last 12 months, as we sit here, we've issued benchmarks in five, five of those six currencies that I mentioned earlier. So um, we we've obviously rotate through a lot of markets. Um, but it, it, it represents sort of uh, maybe 30-40% of our funding plan. We do a lot of um, senior unsecured as well. And uh, again, uh, well, we, we issued unsecured in about uh, a dozen currencies. Um, and then we, you know, domestically we use a lot of the um, um, uh, CMHC um, related um, securitization programs as well for a lot of our uh, funding needs as well. So. Um, we obviously use it as it's it's one of uh, one of the two tools. It's obviously become a, a key tool for us, and I would expect our issuance pattern in the next year to look um, not a whole lot different than the than the previous year. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think to, to very quickly conclude these different uh, impressions that we got, I think uh, opportunities are there, interesting opportunities. Uh, I think we've heard a couple of times, uh, let's say, risk costs being very low. Uh, I think that's always something that I personally would like to hear as an investor. And the good news is these opportunities are coming uh, rather soon. Uh, furthermore, I think the importance of legislation is understood. Maybe still, still a bit of fine-tuning is needed, but I think it's clearly understood. Um, and I think another point that we might take from this discussion is that uh, it somehow needs a trigger to realign economic realities if there is too many uh, funding alternatives domestically. And I think Loic kind of invited everyone to tap the domestic market. Uh, you might, uh, well, delay uh, the, the, uh, your entry into international markets. Um, but let's say at the end of the day, um, I think still a very interesting product in, in, in the times we currently have. LCR, something we haven't really talked about, might be um, a bit of a limitation in one way, but uh, looking at, at it from a real money ins uh, uh, investor point of view, I think it's also a possibility to re reintegrate a lot of investors who currently have just disappeared, basically, under the influence of the ECB. Um, mainstream, I think another word that came along uh, a couple of times, and I think uh, transparency as well, we refer to uh, comments that Luca made before, um, I think that is uh, something that you can never uh, uh, invest too much work on. Um, diversification in terms of funding, obviously one of the main benefits, and not only diversifying funding, but also uh, making your funding more robust in times of market stress, potentially, which I think is, is another great value that you might find difficult to, uh, to put uh, euro or dollar amounts on. Uh, but, but talking currencies, obviously, um, I think uh, euro-covered uh, bonds being obviously the heart uh, of, the, of, the, of the covered bond market, which I think was stated very on uh, early, um, is, uh, is something that uh, we hopefully will see many of you, uh, uh, let's say, entering um, this, this market segment sooner or later. We wish you uh, success. We need you, by the way. Um, so from this point of view, thanks again, uh, my, my fellow panelists, for their contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, the ECBC for putting together this, this uh, very li nice lineup, and thank you for your patience uh, and listening in. Uh, I'm not sure, Luca, in the interest of time, we, we take questions, maybe not, and we discuss them over, over cocktail, uh, realizing that we are uh, the only ones uh, uh, left uh, between, uh, between now and, uh, and the opening party of the ECBC. But anyway, thanks for your attention.